Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. <clears throat> you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, we commit ourselves to you again. Now as we look to your word, help me, Lord, to speak your words. Give us ears to hear and listen to your spirit, what your spirit is telling us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week, uh, Brother Shaji was sharing on the verses prior to this, living as citizens of heaven, and I liked the way he broke it up and uh, looked at the latter part of the passage first and then went back to the first passage. And that uh, sets the stage, last week it set the stage for this week. And the bulk of the message of this week, or the bulk of the text, is something that theologians have bantered back and forth over the centuries. And there are literally hundreds of thousands of books written on just these passages, on how to interpret these passages. For it talks about Christ emptying himself, how can you say, well, how can Christ empty himself? And there's some of these things which we'll take a look at. And so these are some of the historically, theologically debated passages of Scripture. But what I want to do tonight is take a look at the introduction to it, because the introduction, the one verse, sets the stage of how to interpret and why it was even written to begin with. And this is the... Uh, helps us understand the key to living right and walking right. Because we've all seen that in church history and currently, how people can perhaps say the right things, but live wrongly. And so an outsider, an observer would say, of what value is it to know right, but to live wrong? So more importantly is that we live right, we conduct ourselves in the household of God according to the Scripture and the way He has a, and wants us to live. And, um, and this is what this passage does. Verse 5 starts it. So the text, if it's on there, if, if I do put the text on, it's coming from the Brian literal translation. We've all got different uh, English translations plus whatever language you may have in front of you. But I'm going to use that as the uh, base. The, because the, the first verse, verse 5, sets up a very, very important statement. And he says here, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So the heading I've given it to it is, Have the mind of Christ. Because if you have the mind of Christ you've also got the knowledge of Christ. And you've got the behavior of Christ. It's not just good enough to have the knowledge. Not enough. There's been churches in the past that had the correct orthodoxy. They've had the correct teaching. But the application of it goes wrong. And then there's those who just have it looks like you have the right behavior, but if the behavior is not backed with the right orthodox, with the right teaching, when another behavior comes along, they can easily be swayed. And so we need both the knowledge and the behavior and the application of the knowledge. And I'll explain that. There's a word that we'll look at to in shortly, which will help us explain that. And so here he says, he starts off this passage after telling us, let's, let's go back to verse, uh, well, back to chapter 1, what Brother Shadji talked about last week. Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven. And two weeks prior to that, I talked about the word above all. In summary, 
Having said everything else, this is the most important. These things. Live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Then whether I come and see again you or only hear about you, I will know that you are standing together with one spirit and one purpose, fighting together with a faith for the faith, which is the good news. Don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed. For you've been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for Him. For we in this struggle, for we in this struggle together, you have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I'm still in the midst of it. And he's setting about the beha behaviors and the patterns and the ways to do it. This was two weeks ago. Now, last week. Is there any encouragement from belonging in Christ? Any comfort in His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. And don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. And don't look out only to your own interest, but take the interest in others too. And so just within these few verses, you have a whole lot of do's and don'ts. When we read through the Old Testament, there's a lot of do's and don'ts. You've got the Ten Commandments and you've got all of Deuteronomy 28 telling you all the good things to do and the bad things not to do. And so these things are absolutely important. But here's the problem with all the do's and don'ts. If you, if you focus on all the do's and don'ts, okay, you get a headache. Because <laughs> there's many do's and there's even more don'ts. And you, you know, sometimes you can go through life and someone can say, well, there's only, you know, they can give you 10 principles of successful living or 20 principles of staying healthy. And you focus on those principles and you forget the big picture. And so verse 5, the text that we're looking at today, breaks through all of this and cuts to the chase and says, how do you live right? How do you do it? Easy. Or sorry. Simple. Not necessarily easy. It's simple. Have the mind of Christ. And when you have the mind of Christ, and if we operate and live with the mind of Christ, we adopt and we come into and we're grafted into His mind and His heart. And then all of these things will be a natural flow out of them. remember listening to uh, a radio station, uh, uh, Brother James Dobson, and he interviewed someone, a medical doctor, and was talking about healthy living and how to have eat the right type of foods. And so it was a, quite a long program. And the doctor was saying, you know, eat this food, avoid this food, make this food in this particular way, and don't make it this way, and on and on and on. And so at the end of the program, I think Dr. Dobson reflected what many of us that would be listening to it would say, how on earth are we supposed to remember all this stuff? <laughs> so he asked the doctor, make it easy for us. What's the rule of thumb? What's the fast way of learning this? And the doctor said, very easy. Very easy. He's a Christian. He said, how did God give us the food? Eat it that way. A quick example. Now, I, and I learned this out of two reasons. Number one, because it made sense. But also, when I was a bachelor, I was incredibly lazy. I'm not a chef. So I learned to do things the fast way, the best way. So I learned not to cook my vegetables. <laughs> I was lazy. I'm hungry. I want to eat. I eat the vegetables raw. And praise God, a doctor vindicated me. <laughs> if God wanted us to eat boiled vegetables, He would have boiled them. And then the point what the doctor was saying, he says, here's the problem. You boil all this stuff. Where do your nutrients go? In the water. What do you do with the water? Pour it down the sink. And what are you eating? Straw. <laughs> says, eat it the way God gave it. That's the best rule of thumb. And that's why we don't eat margarine. That's why we eat butter. And things like that. Don't eat synthetic things. Eat the genuine things. Eat what God gives us. And, and so forth. And so in similar ways... Okay? In similar ways, we have to do it this way. Keep life simple. Sometimes we make Christianity far, far, far too complicated. Far too complicated. And there's certain rules that we can easily make. And this was the problem of the Pharisees. They had all the rules and regulations. 
around the law that the people couldn't even see the law. There's no way they could break the law because they couldn't even see the law. And Jesus came along and kicked the fence down around the law and said, let's take a look at the law and what does it really say? And then there's going, wow, I didn't know this. And Jesus says, well, by the way, I've come to fulfill the law. I've come to give you a better way. I've come to give you freedom in Christ. And Jesus and then and, uh, says it himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Paul uh, articulates it a lot better. He's, uh, Paul just says, live in Christ and you'll fulfill everything else. Live by the Spirit. And when we live by the Spirit of what God wants us to, we'll live in the freedom that He wants us to. And so this is what He's saying here. After telling us what to do and how to do it, He goes on in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, this word mind was very interesting when I looked at it. And I already started talking a little bit about it. Uh, proneo. I think the next slide, if you click it once, it should go on to the next thing here. It means to have understanding or to think. Now that's the most brief definition. But look at it further. To regulate or to moderate from within as an inner perspective or an insight shows itself in corresponding outward behavior. When I read that the first time, I go, what? I have to go back and read that again. and Read it a bit slower. To regulate, moderate, from within. In other words, instinctively, from the inside. This is what we do. Our brain and our spirits process an awful lot of information okay, as to how we behave. Let me give you an example. You're crossing the street. You look both ways, street's clear. You start walking. And you're not in a hurry, so you walk slow. But all of a sudden you hear a noise and you look again and you realize there's some car that came out of nowhere and it's flying right at you. Okay? What do you do? This is what you do. You moderate from within as an inner perspective or insight shows itself corresponding outward behavior. And what is the outward behavior? <laughs> you run! Okay? You don't sit there and analyze it. It's something that takes your cognitive uh, information and intuitively you put everything together and you run across that street as fast as possible. It essentially it equates to personal opinions fleshing itself out into actions. This is what we call a mindset. And everyone in this room, all of us, there's not one, not one or not two of us that have the same mindset. Now, the longer that I'm married to my wife, the more and more our minds become the same. How many years married now? <laughs> Ask the wife right on. <laughs> decades. We'll say it decades. You, you have your individual, but as you live together, you begin to take on each other's minds. Why? Because you learn to react in similar manner. And it's always fascinating going and seeing a couple who is celebrating their silver or, or gold or diamond okay, anniversary, and you see that they not only think the same, sometimes even start looking the same. Okay? Um, what, what is this? There's this emergence over the course of time. Now that's an external example, but how much more an internal example? And this is the problem with people with mental disorders because they can't put into order their internal and the cognitive thinking. It doesn't match. There's, there's a disjoint somewhere. And so they can be given the right information, but they don't know how to process that and put it into the right action. And this is what Paul is writing here. Have the mind of Christ. And what does the mind of Christ do? The mind of Christ assimilates stuff and puts us into the right direction and thinking. There's another definition on this. Maybe one more slide, please, on this. What's the next one? To have the mind of Christ. This idea is difficult to translate into English because it combines the visceral, that is the intuitive stuff, and the cognitive, that is the intellectual part, aspects of thinking okay it combines the two and um, probably the, the a, a close definition or parallel it's not the same but a parallel thing is that of wisdom people who are wise people who who know information and they know how to how to use the right information okay but this is a a, a, a concept of 
of uh, having the mind of Christ. Walking like Him. Behaving like Him. Acting like Him. How can you act like someone? Now, there's, there's a difference between being a parrot, and that's what actors and comedians do. They know how to parrot someone. Okay, So you can see someone on, on a stage somewhere, and they can parrot, uh, whether a politician or a movie star or something like that, and everyone laughs and gets a good laugh out of it. But when that person walks off the stage, who are they? They're back to themselves. Okay, And that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a mindset, having the mind of Christ. So no matter where we are 24-7, we operate with the mind of Christ. We work with the information that He has. We join ourselves with Him. We have His mind. And then we also have his lifestyle. The two. And this is what he's saying here. And this is, uh, well, let's move on here. Um, uh, Romans, Romans 12, for example. Okay? We, the, the very classic one here, very classic uh, passage of scripture along this line. He's talking about um, uh, the life in, in Christ and, and who we are. And then it's like he, he puts it all together. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because He has, of all He has done for you, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. And don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Many times, young, especially young people, young adults, they say, we want to know the will of God for our lives. Well, it's an easier way to know the will of God by, that, by living in His will, living in His mindset. And if you think the way Jesus thinks, and if you walk the way He walks, your path will be determined a whole lot easier. Sometimes we're guilty of making ourselves rules and regulations, and then we get burdened down by them. This, in order for us to look at the next few verses, because the next few verses I don't want to actually dig into them, because there's church history has done that, and they're still debating about some of the verses. So the point of this, this message tonight is to, is to fly a little bit higher and to see the bigger picture from, the, from a higher altitude of how it is that we are to live successfully on earth. How do we do all the things that we learned last Sunday and the Sunday before and the things that Paul wrote here to the church in Philippi? Um, it, I don't like to have to wake up in the morning and have a whole list of things what to do. For example, I don't want to wake up in the morning and have to tell myself, okay, today don't kill anyone. Okay? Today don't commit adultery. Today don't steal. We, well, here's the problem with that kind of a thinking. And some people live like this. They live legalistically. They live on things that they are not to do, and then they list the things that they are to do. Here's the problem with that all the lists we have are going to fall short. And if we focus on the lists, we're going to miss the spirit of what's going on. Because God is dynamic. He doesn't just give us a, a simple pathway which is straight for the next thousand miles or for us for the next hundred years and say, here's the path and wind us up and then set us down and off we march. No. As we know, life is very dynamic. There's lots of corners, lots of turns. And sometimes when it looks like a straight path, all of a sudden there's a mudslide that comes and the road's covered. And you got to know what to do. And rather than sit there all of a sudden and look at a book and see how to get through it, we should have these things in our heart. That's why the psalmist said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that when we walk along the pathway and the mudslide comes, on the spot we should know what to do either through direct directives from Scripture or by the Spirit of God, which will guide us at that spot what to do. Just to give you a practical example of that, um, when, with raising kids, uh, you, you, can, you can get frustrated trying to teach your children to 
turn the lights off when they leave a room. Or when they wash their hands to turn the water off. And what is it you're trying to teach them? Are you really trying to teach them to turn the lights off when they leave a room? No. Are you really trying to teach them to turn water off? No. What are we, what's at the root of it? We're trying to teach them thrift. We're trying to teach them economy. Because the child is not paying for the lights that are not being used in the room. The child doesn't pay for the water that's running out of the tap. Who's paying for it? You are. You're the parent. And so what we're trying to teach our children is to be thrift and to economize so that when they grow up and they have to pay for it, that they won't waste water, they won't waste electricity. Okay? And that's the heart of it. And so it's always the challenge of the parents, therefore, not to teach. And, and of course, when they're young, you, <laughs> you have no choice, but you have to teach them, turn the lights off, and you tell them all of these principles. But you hope that somewhere along the stage, that you don't tell them these basics, but that they learn thrift and they learn economy in their own hearts. And so that on their own, they will learn to start saving money and that they learn not to throw money away. Or that they will learn to be hygienic on their own. You hope after a few years that you don't have to tell them to wash their hands after they use their washroom. Because the bigger principle of what you're trying to teach them is to be clean. And if they're clean in all things, of course they will wash their hands when they leave the washroom or before they leave the washroom. Of course they will turn the lights off when they walk out the door. Of course they will turn the water off when they're uh, finished using it. That'll happen. But not just that. And they won't do it because it's a checklist they go down because they caught the bigger principle. And I always say that, you know, with the, with the kids, you know, trying to do these things, same thing with making a room clean. You can also bang your head trying to get the kids to clean the room because it's a thing to do. It's a checkbox to make. But if you can, you, if the child gets it, they will understand cleanliness up front. And if they understand cleanliness up front, guess what? They won't make the room dirty. And if they don't make the room dirty, you don't have to clean it. So when you finish cleaning with your toys, you put them away. Practical examples. And as Christians, that's why we keep, as Christians, that's why we as Christians keep our houses clean. This is a by the way, this is free. This is why we keep our houses clean. So that if an unexpected guest comes, you don't have to scramble to clean up. Why? Because you're a Christian. You keep your house clean. It's simple. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be spotless at all times, or else you'd be running around all day with a mop. But the point is, if something gets dirty, you clean it up right away. And so as we learn this principle in the natural and learn to live right at all times, just like when I get out of bed in the morning, I get out of bed, the cover's in my hand, and rather than just drop it because it's in my hand, I just turn around and right away put it straight. It's done. I don't have to touch that anymore. It's finished. And it doesn't matter if a guest later walks by. I know I've, I've made the bed ready. Now, that's a natural principle. That's natural. Now, let's take that principle and apply it to our lives. Put it to our spiritual lives. The real us. The real you. The real me. Are we disciplined in our spirits? That is natural for us to wake up in the morning and, re and want to read the Word of God and to want to pray and throughout the day to pray. It should be natural, not a checklist that we do. And as we learn to live like this, what we're doing is we're actually learning to live in the mind of Christ. Have this mind in you. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And that's why Jesus didn't go in the day without prayer. I, I'm, I'm just fascinated with this. Um, uh, with what, who Jesus was and why He did some of the things He did. We'll perhaps get on to that a bit later. Let's look at verse now 6 to 8. These verses, these three verses talk about the mind of Christ is now explained because verse 5 says, have the mind of Christ and verses 6 to 8 actually explain the mind of Christ. What does this mean? What is the mind of Christ? Well, look at this. This is fascinating. Verse 6, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider to be equal with God something to be grasped. 
Well, look at this here. The noun, the last noun. In English, it's long. Something to be grasped. Something grasped. What do you grasp? That, that word, that noun, this, this Greek word, is, is quite interesting. It talks about um, something that is, it, it, it's a spoil. It's, it, it's something you acquire. It's something that you uh, desire. It's a prize. Um, something to be grasped. Something to be desired, to attain. What runner, what runner in a race doesn't want to grasp the trophy. They, they all do. That, that's why they're running it. They're running it to get the gold medal. And that's an honorable, right, good type of grasping to do. Something tangible that you can hang on to. Um, we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we desiring for? What are we striving to grasp? Now, it may not be tangible. Maybe it is tangible. Maybe you're, you're you know, pursuing things of this world. Uh, um, stuff. Stuff. Money. Stuff. Possessions. Um, once you grasp it, how long are you going to hang on to it for? Because we can't take it with us to eternity. Um, but there's other things sometimes that are not tangible that sometimes it's so easy to hang, get caught up with as well. Uh, power. Prestige position, reputation, saving face, looking good, all of this kind of stuff. To save face in front of others. Some of these things, it's amazing sometimes what people will do to grasp these type of things. And here's where Jesus comes in stark contrast to that. In fact, Isaiah 52 points that out. In fact, he was so marred that the people didn't even recognize him. He was willing, although he was God, he didn't grasp that. He released that. He let it go. And he went to the far extreme and was willing to be empty-handed and come up. In fact, verse 7 says that. Let's, let's go on to that. But he emptied himself having taken the form of a servant and having been made in the likeness of men. <laughs> he was God. He was God. And He continued to be God. But in addition to that, He took on the form of man. Now this word here, this, uh, this uh, canoe, actually there, there's this, it's an easy way to remember canoe because when you're, when you're going on a safari, you don't get, if you go into a ship, okay, if you go into a ship, you can take all your luggage with you. You go into a canoe, you're going by yourself. Okay? Very little comes with. But this word, they get this word kenosis and, and uh, the, the knowledge. This word has been bantered around quite a bit about what does it mean? How could, how could Jesus have emptied Himself? And what, did, what, is, what was Paul writing about here? And um, we could spend literally weeks just getting in on this here, but the, the basic concept again is that He had, He had it all. He had it all. But he was willing to let go and come down and take on the form of a man, a frail human like you and me, and be vulnerable to the same things that we're vulnerable to. And to, in the midst of that, pursue holiness, righteousness, and above all, a relation with the Father. And how did he do it? His mindset. The information that he had plus his, his soul, who he was, was fully aligned by his spirit, driven by his spirit. Okay? That's the mind of Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. Have the mind of Christ. You're not hanging on to the things of the world. Don't worry about reputation. Don't worry about stuff. Let it go. Let it go. And follow after the ways of God. This, this word, to empty oneself, okay, to empty oneself, isn't that even in English we use this term, uh, the, the opposite? we use quite a bit say oh that person's sure full of himself <laughs> it's a very derogatory statement towards someone if they're full of themselves and rightfully so because Jesus wasn't full of himself in that sense he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant and said and says to us follow me so we ask ourselves the question, if we empty ourselves of ourselves, what do we fill it with? Christ in you, the hope of glory.
I died to self, it's Christ who lives inside of me. Well, let's go on to verse 8. This is a school of obedience. School of obedience. And having been found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, having become obedient unto death, even death of the cross. Hebrews 5.8 is a very fascinating verse. It just, it, it just, it's amazing, this verse. I, many times, very difficult to understand, but in light of this, it's understandable. Hebrews 5.8, Even though Jesus was God's Son, He learned obedience from the things He suffered. So in His suffering, He learned obedience. Now, for us, when we use the word learned, we often say, I have acquired information that I didn't know before. But that's only a limited definition of the word learn. Okay? Learn also has the definite, part of the definition of learn also means to acquire first-hand knowledge, first-hand experience. Okay? And that's why we often say that. Oh, I learned that the hard way, or I learned it in the school of Knox. Sometimes, you know, you can go to school and get an education, you get your degree and certificate and so forth, but it's actually as we go through life that we learn other principles in life. And this is what this is here. Learn Jesus Himself had to learn obedience. He had to walk through the step. He was challenged to disobey. Seriously, at the beginning of His ministry, Satan came, challenged Him to disobey. Three times, Satan clearly tempted him. He overcame that. Then throughout different times, many times he could have walked away, but he didn't. Obedient unto death. And this sort of helps me answer the question I had, why would the Son of God have to pray so much? Why does He have to pray so much? Because He has to be renewed in His mind. Jesus had to do that continuously make sure that what he seen with his eyes, what he heard with his ears, the things, the senses that were putting into him, whether it was the applause of people or the pellets of people, it doesn't matter what they were trying to pull him up or push him down, that didn't matter. No matter what people said or didn't say, he had to focus on his Father to do the will of the Father. He had to learn obedience. He had to walk this through. And... Um, in his 40 days, that's what a lot of that had to happen. A refining and tuning of the heart. Obedience is an alignment of spirit, soul and body to the will of God. God is triune. He said, let us make man in our own image. And how did he make man? He made him body, soul and spirit. We have a body. We have a mind which processes things. And we have a spirit. And from the beginning, and Adam and Eve lived with their spirits moving and giving them directives, just as the Father is the one who sets the initiative in the triune God. He sets the stage. Okay? How is that manifest? In the evening, He would come down. Jesus would come down, meet Adam and Eve, talk with them. Right? And what is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit teaches us all things. The Holy Spirit works in our, with our cognitive mind to give us revelation in our minds by renewing our minds of what our spirit is trying to do. And that's why it's so important, I believe, to speak in tongues. Because the, just the very act of speaking in tongues, our, spirit, our spirits grow close to God, but our minds don't. And because it's the Holy Spirit doing that, He can tell our mind, relax, relax, just feed the spirit. And then, in the course of time, He may interpret for us. And so we find this, this, this beautiful unity of, of God the Father, God the uh, Holy Spirit, and God the Son. And he says, Let's, let us make man in our image. And therefore, it's so important that we have this internal alignment. And you can always see that. People who are disturbed, who act differently, and who don't act according to the mind of Christ, they're not aligned with body, soul, and spirit. And there's an agitation in them. And you know what it's like when you're in a setting and there's some agitation, you don't quite understand it. Your mind says, this is good. Your, your body says, well, I'm listening to it. It all sounds good. But there's some agitation in your spirit. Well, let me tell you, go with the agitation in your spirit. Pay attention to it. If it's the Spirit of God, He's telling you something. Pay attention to it. And follow that through. And let your spirit lead your mind. And this is the whole thing about the mind. Remember that definition that we look, looked at earlier about this blend between the uh, intellectual and the, um, and the internal? 
This takes it now a step further. This is, this is, these are human words trying to define a spiritual reality. We are Christians. We are spirit beings. And as our, our spirits align to the Spirit of God, the Father, let our minds align. And let us have the mind of Christ and live in the mind of Christ. Sometimes we don't understand things. And Paul writes it to the Corinthians. He says, in former times, God's ways were higher than our ways, and we didn't understand them. And then Paul continues to write, he says, but we have the mind of Christ. We have it. We can walk in it. And here's where he says that. Obedience is alignment. Very simple. Verses eight, 9 to 11. We just want to round this up here and close off. This is the result. Here's the result of obedience. This is what happened when Jesus obeyed his Father. He aligned himself with his Father's will. Therefore, God highly exalted him and granted to him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He let it go and became a servant. What was the end result of that? God exalted him higher than anything else. Higher than anything else. No name higher than the name of Jesus. Saints, we have no idea. We have no idea what God wants to do with each one here tonight when we learn to align our minds with Him, to take on the mind of Christ. When we learn to give up of self and come into Him and let Christ rule in us, the future, amazing. Absolutely amazing. What well, we can't even imagine. If I could have the worship team come up, please. Let's bow our heads and just close our eyes and just meditate on that what in the Scriptures today. What is God speaking to your heart today? Are we living in the fullness of of the mind of Christ, the fullness of what He has for us. If you're here today and you haven't yet accepted Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, after the service, just come and talk to one of us uh, as elders here. We'll be glad to introduce you to Jesus. If you're here today and you have another burden on your heart, you need a prayer, for something, please just come talk with us. Let's all stand we, as we close off in, in prayer and sing a final song. Father, we commit ourselves to you. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the invitation to have the mind of Christ, the invitation to walk in the ways that you have destined for us. Thank you for that. Dismiss us with your love. May your love, O oh Father, and the grace of your Son, Jesus, and the fellowship of your Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen.